Hello everyone, I'd like to um, welcome you to a short presentation about what I wish I'd known before I embarked on a career in teaching English. My name is Hijab Zahir, I am the principal at Northern Education Trust Red House Academy. I've been teaching for over 10 years um, and I hope that this presentation is of value to you all and I'll be speaking to you practitioners from different levels of experience um, from different specialisms I hope there's something in here that you can all hopefully um, add to your teaching um, but uh, at least give you something to think about okay I think before I begin talking about um, some general aspects of teaching English and some specific aspects with regards to um, different areas of the subject uh, I just want us to ensure that we all appreciate that teaching English at GCSE um, isn't just about preparing students to complete a formal qualification and be able to have the um, grades required for them to move on to the next steps of their education or employment. A lot of teaching English at GCSE is more than that um, and it's about ensuring that the students have the ability and the confidence to express themselves, to appropriately adapt their language for the different contexts, environments and audiences that they're speaking to um, and to help them live fulfilled and happy lives. Um, a lot of young people struggle to uh, express how they feel um, about the world around them and themselves um, and I do believe that teaching English as a subject it allows them the opportunity to develop those skills that can hopefully allow them to use communication to form positive relationships. Okay what I wish I'd known about teaching English lessons planned by others um, we are in a very fortunate position um, that uh, a lot of our colleagues across the Trust have worked hard to produce lessons that many of us are able to use. But um, I think it's important for us to know that when we are teaching lessons planned by others, um, the key thing is that we understand the end goal um, and the process towards it. Often when we're planning our own lessons, we follow the advice of deciding where you want your students to end up with regards to um, an actual physical outcome you want them to create but also in terms of you know what you want them to know um, and then we work backwards when we're using somebody else's planning um, someone else has done that thinking and I think it's very important for us to take the time to ensure that we have an awareness of, of that thinking before we embark on teaching the lesson when teaching a lesson that other people have planned or to be honest when teaching all lessons I, uh, I believe it's really important that we understand that students um, what students do is important within the lesson what they know by the end of the lesson is more important but what they can do again by themselves in particular is the most important um, and I would encourage all teachers but particularly um, teachers new to the profession or new to the subject to see the teaching of English um, as a long-term process over a series of lessons to lead to a higher level of skill um, that can be applied independently across different contexts. That, that's the ultimate goal for myself when I'm teaching English. Um, what a student can do in each individual lesson and produce in each individual lesson has to facilitate that goal um, being achieved. And I think it's really important when we're teaching lessons planned by others that we ensure that our lessons don't become standalone entities that don't kind of add to that higher higher purpose. So I think it's really important that we do that. But I also think it's important that we, you know, staff a person, personalised lesson, they're brave enough to adapt lessons. 
within the appropriate parameters of course we have certain structures that we want students to use certain processes certain planning strategies um, that we want them to be consistent across a department and across the entire trust um, but with regards to the stimulus that you use the examples that you use how you relate your teaching to your own experience although you're teaching a lesson that's planned by somebody else it is important for teachers to be brave enough to to adapt those lessons to um kind of have ownership of them what i wish i'd known about watching others teach english so i think the first thing i would say is uh, we're blessed to have uh, so many experienced talented and successful professionals across the subject um and across all our academies that would encourage staff uh, as much as possible to watch their colleagues um, I don't think there is a better way to learn how to teach in overall, um, but particularly with English. Um, but when watching others teach English, I would encourage staff to look out for these particular things. I think the questioning is the most important skill when it comes to teaching English. Um, I believe that the ability of a teacher to question really um, allows them to tap into um, a student's potential within English. So looking at how teachers differentiate their questions, how they direct certain questions to encourage students to reach certain conclusions or make inferences from texts, um, how they use questions to offer wider exploration about the text rather than a fixed opinion a student may have. Um, but I think it's really important to see the, the repetitive nature of teachers questioning um, and how that repetitive nature allows the students to uh, kind of create an, their own internal questioning voice which they will need to apply um, when they're working independently. Modelling is obviously a key teaching strategy across all subject disciplines but in English um, it is crucial to show students how to effectively use the structure to articulate their thoughts in a cohesive and coherent manner. Often we will get students say something along the lines of I know what I'm trying to say but I don't know how to say it and essentially how I kind of read that is uh, they have uh, the ideas um, and they have views but they don't have a clear embedded structure within their minds um, to allow them to follow a step-by-step -step process to to get those thoughts on paper so it's really important that we use modeling to show those um, we'll often show students um, an example of a perfect paragraph or a golden paragraph i also think it's important to show students um, varying grades of paragraphs um, or paragraphs or examples that are varying levels um, of skill to allow students to be able to see the difference um, and discuss the difference uh, and also allow them to see where their writing fits in with some of the examples that they've been given. Given a golden paragraph is obviously a very useful skill but if that's all students are given then sometimes the only judgment they can make is mine isn't as good as that um giving them a variety of paragraph allows them to be able to see well mine's stronger than that one because of this and and mine could be even stronger if i took some elements of this one um i, I think that as an overall process is often more enriching than just uh, looking at one example paragraph. Uh, in terms of appropriate ratio, I've put that down to suggest that when modeling, you may, at the start of a unit of work, when students are unfamiliar with uh, what you're doing, you, you may heavily um, lead the students in formulating a paragraph, for example. Um, let's say you will do 90% of it and you might use your questioning to ask them to fill in the next 10%. Sometimes it might be appropriate to completely flip that and give the students the independence to then write one which is predominantly their own. However, in many cases, when students are just developing comfortability with a new process or they may be of varying levels of ability, you may want to put intermediate steps in place to ensure that that ratio is kind of maybe goes from 90 10 to 70 30 and then 50 50 to gradually get to a point where those students have that level of independence um one example of doing that is if you the first time you ask them to write a paragraph um rather than ask them to write the entire paragraph is just bullet point what 
each of the sentences could be. Um, so there might be five sentences in that paragraph, just one or two words that could identify your first sentence, your second sentence will be X about X and Y. And that then puts an intermediate modeling kind of step where you have you've modeled the ideas but not the entire paragraph. Um, and that then might allow students to to kind of have a more comfortable level of um, challenge for the next activity. Uh, I always think it's important to have connections in teaching English um, and I think that's where all teachers, regardless of experience, should be able to relate whatever they're teaching to real life, past experiences, their own or their students or other texts that they have studied. And those connections are really important for students for them to be able to see that that English is a is a kind of living subject um, and it's not just a case of studying a, you know a text which doesn't is not something they can identify to i'm just going to move on to specific um, elements of, of teaching english in terms of the content of the subject um, so what i'd wish i'd known about teaching novels uh, firstly is that enjoying the story is the first step um, i do believe that within all of us there's a certain element that just you know, we like a good story. Um, you know, we might be entertained by movies or TV dramas or just an engaging story told by a friend. And I think that, that love of a good story is a, a starting point for any text that you're teaching. Um, I think before you get into the analysis side of it, you there needs to be a certain level of enjoyment um, and excitement and interest. Um, so I would always try and encourage that. Simple ways to do that is if you're navigating your way through a novel with uh, a class, um, ensure that you end lessons at specific points where you, you're going to be leaving the students desperate to find out what will be happening next. Um, that level of anticipation, I think, is going to motivate young people and keep them engaged. Once you've done that, you can then encourage students to see layers within a story. Um, uh, you know, I've split these into three sections um, to just give people a broad outline of, of what I'm trying to get across. So the plot setting and characters, I would say, is knowledge of a story um, and relationship themes and context is understanding of a story and techniques, structure and impact is analysis of that story. Um, obviously, there's overlap within those, but uh, what I'm really trying to uh, encourage people to think about is that the layers the stories have different layers and it's important for students to know that but also know when they themselves are able to um, go between the layers because that shows a greater level of skill and that is something to praise and celebrate um, and that's an opportunity to kind of make the students feel clever and I think you know uh, there may be more articulate ways of expressing that but um, I, really the simple thing is that moment where a student says something and they just feel really pleased with themselves. Um, and I would encourage teachers to try and get students to see stories as, as puzzles that have got lots of hidden meanings and layers. Um, and in terms of a, a teacher mindset, um, I think it's important for us to think about the, the best answers being the ones we've never heard before. And from that, I mean that we may be looking at a text that we've analyzed beforehand and we're expecting to to hear certain responses from students and it's important that we're still open-minded to allow students to explore and come up with their own interpretations um, and that's where i think a lot of engagement comes from and i'm just going to use an example there to illustrate what i mean a colleague of mine was teaching of mice and men a few years ago um, at one of our academies and a long time ago because you know, obviously it's not a GCSE text anymore um, and the um, stu uh, student had said that about George and Lenny at the start um, they were looking up to the trees and that almost showed a limitation in their aspirations for themselves as they weren't even able to look up into the sky um, and that was the first time I'd heard that from a student the first time that teacher had heard that um, and it's just something that stuck with me and I think it's important for teachers to see every lesson where they're teaching a text um, as having the potential of having one of those moments in um, I think that uh, going in with that mindset allows students to really explore the text and I think that keeps engagement levels high. Um, 
What I wish I'd known about teaching Shakespeare, the first thing is um, try not to, to let the language become a barrier for the students. Um, it, it is very easy and unfortunately a default position for some students to be able to, to just look at the language and say there's too much of that that I can't comprehend at first glance and therefore it's too difficult. Um, I think it's our job as teachers to translate, simplify, delete elements of the text to allow students to really engage with it. There will always be time for analysis and depth later, but students need to get over that initial barrier that sometimes they have. Um, and to allow students to do that, I'd like staff to be able to focus on the similarities as much as the differences within the text. Many of Shakespeare's themes are just as prevalent in modern society. And I think if you can allow students to see that the themes are still prevalent um, and the behaviours of the characters are still relevant, then the, the actual language then doesn't become a barrier. It's just a expression, a different expression of the same kind of life that we live today. For example, you know, the discrimination that is explored in Merchant of Venice could be compared to discrimination that's in our society today. Uh, even things such as the um, Tybalt's reaction to being mocked by Mercutio and Romeo and Juliet, could that be related to how a teenage boy would hate to be mocked um, in front of a group of his peers by one of his friends and how might he react to that situation. Um, and I think when it comes to an extract, it's really important for students to know that they don't need to analyse every single sentence of that extract. Um, trying to get them to focus on what they can do rather than what they can't do is, is something that's more empowering for students. Um, a task as simple as giving them an extract and a highlighter and saying just find four lines that you understand um, is much more I suppose open and empowering for a student if they can do that rather than giving them the extract and say read the extract and um, see if you can work out what it means um, that might be something that's overwhelming for some learners okay uh, what i wish i'd known about teaching poetry firstly i'd say annotate the poem know the poem in depth because that will allow you to ask the right kind of questions um, annotate it yourself as well um, it's I suppose it's easy to photocopy somebody else's annotations and try and teach from them, but there is uh, so much value in taking the time to annotate that poem yourself and really think about why you're making certain notes and you know why uh, you would want to perhaps tease out certain things from from students um, and use different sources as a wealth of information on the on the internet but also discuss the poems with colleagues um, and it'll be really interesting to see how you know different interpretations or approaches to the poems can really uh, add value to your teaching Another thing that I would recommend is to re-annotate your poem after you've taught. Um, it's whilst ideas are fresh in your mind, whilst comments that students have made are fresh in your mind, it's it's an it's a good idea to to add to that, and then that's something over time that we can be a really valuable resource for yourself. Um, I would always be an advocate of reading the poem to the class. I believe that poems are meant to be heard rather than read, um, and and I think that that's a important opportunity for us to model um, the importance of reading aloud in in class um, and but I also appreciate that the you know that that can be quite daunting um, particularly if you're new to the profession or perhaps not a subject specialist um, I'd say that isn't something that is natural to a lot of people um, and it is something that you've got just got to have a willingness to prepare now I once taught Edgar Allan Poe's uh, poem The Raven um, and I was adamant that I was going to do this without reading it off a piece of paper so I don't know how many times I practiced it but I memorized the poem I couldn't do it now um, but the first time I recited the poem um, from memory in front of the class was a moment that had that class hooked with poetry for the entire unit of work um, and I just think that the, you have that opportunity to really sell the subject through your performance with poetry and, and I would encourage staff to do that as much as possible. Repetition of questions is crucial when you're analysing poetry, in my opinion. It allows students to develop a kind of an innate analysis strategy um, uh, that becomes a habit for them to look at poems um, and that's crucial when they get to GCSE and they look at the unseen poetry so the the 
15 poems in the anthology, for example, uh, and taught not just to know those poems, but also to learn the skill of analyzing a poem, um, which, so the repetition of questions um, really helps students kind of develop a, a habit of questions. And they can be as simple as, you know, what does the title of the poem tell you? You know, what's the significance of the first word? Um, does the poem rhyme? How many stanzas are there? How many lines in a stanza? All of those kind of generic questions that you can ask for every poem over time become questions that the students ask themselves. Um, and with poetry as well, I'd encourage staff to um, ensure that students analyse structure as well as language. We obviously have a tendency to analyse the language that, that writers use and quite rightly because it's the highest value skill with regards to reading um, within English but the structure analysis in poetry is is extremely important um, and it is something that's very accessible for students um, so I think it, uh, I would always encourage staff to ensure that they're not neglecting the the analysis of structure within a poem. Um, uh, what I wish I'd known about creating, teaching creative writing. Uh, firstly, planning cannot be overemphasized. Uh, I think students who can get their head around being able to create a high quality plan um, are more than half the way there towards writing a good quality piece of work. So uh, investing a lot of time in teaching students how to plan um, is really important in my opinion. Um, we are again blessed to have tried and tested and proven strategy planning strategies as part of our um, of our English curriculum across the trust. But you know, allowing the students the opportunity to explore these strategies on multiple occasions across contexts is is important to allow students to have the level of comfortability that when they go into an examination or an assessment, um, it's second nature. Um, I would encourage staff to really think about how students formulate paragraphs. Unfortunately for too many young people, um, they start a new paragraph when they think, well, I've, I've covered a certain proportion of my page, I'd better start a new paragraph. Or I've written seven lines, I'd better start a new paragraph. Ensuring that students understand that paragraphs um, generally introduce introduce an idea, develop an idea, extend an idea, then maybe have a contrasting idea and lead to the next paragraph. Um, the flow within a paragraph across different pieces of writing is, is really important for students to understand. Um, and that is something that, you know, I think it's worth investing time into. Independent writing time is crucial. I think that's something that we all know across all subjects. But um, the advice that I would give is that whenever you're asking students to write independently, try and be as consistent um, as possible um, and encourage students to get through their own writing blocks um, themselves by using their plans by using strategies that you may have given them by asking themselves specific questions um and use each one of those independent writing time experiences to uh, tackle potential issues that they may they may get in the exam um students might have a tendency to very quickly um, raise their hand and ask for support the, uh, and obviously a lot of this comes down to judgment but there is something to be said for allowing the students the time to struggle and solve their own problems within their own writing um, in order to overcome those barriers because uh, you know ultimately writing blocks are something that we will all experience um, and you can only overcome them by having actually gone through that process multiple times um, and if I was going to if let's say for example I had two lessons to go before my students were uh, were doing their GCSE exams the two things that I would spend a lot of time on would be vocabulary and sentence structure I think they're the highest value skills when it comes to writing not just creative writing but I think writing in general um, so allowing students the opportunity to build that vocabulary and create themselves a, a bank of their favorite high quality advanced words um, is I think is very valuable in a piece of well 
towards any piece of writing um but and sentence structure allow as well allows them to add depth to their writing um and variety to their writing so i would say that those two skills are the highest value skills um this presentation isn't the opportunity for me to discuss how those could be covered in lessons um, but what i would say is um, if you are wanting to add maximum value to your students writing they're the two things that i would start with um, and your colleagues will have um, many ideas how they can be incorporated into lessons over time uh, and hopefully that will really um, show in your students work okay thank you for taking the, the time to um watch and listen to this presentation i hope it's been of some value to you um i, I will of course be more than happy to answer any questions um that you may want to um to ask following this presentation um and i would like to just take this opportunity to thank you all for joining or um being part of the trust um or even joining the profession those of you new to the profession um joining the specialism those of you who are uh, maybe kind of teaching within the specialism f from uh, an initial subject that you've qualified in um so i just want to say english is a, a wonderful subject to teach um it really allows students to express themselves and explore ideas um, and make sense of the world in which they live in um, but it's really an enabling subject which allows them to achieve across all of the subjects in school but also after they leave um, our academies and move on to their next steps um, so i just want to kind of thank you for your efforts um, and wish you all the best of luck